Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One. And our guest today will be Michael Martin, CEO of Rapid SOS. Rapid SOS is an advanced emergency tech company that is commercializing technology to predict and preempt emergencies before they occur, dynamically warn people in harm's way, and provide a rich data link from any device directly to first responders globally. Together, we discuss the challenges facing 911 IT systems, the powerful impact of rich data feeds on emergency outcomes, and the role of IoT devices in enabling first-time responses and predictive alerts. I highly encourage anyone who is a device manufacturer listening to consider collaborating with Rapid SOS to explore how safety can be added to your value proposition. I hope you found our conversation valuable, and I look forward to your thoughts and comments. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Great uh, Great to be here. So, Michael, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because Rapid SOS is solving such a a specific problem. Often the companies I'm talking to have kind of a horizontal technology. Maybe they're doing predictive analytics that can be applied to a number of different use cases. But you really have a a specific scenario that you're addressing, which is improving the 911 response uh, system. Before we go into the details of the company and and the technology, I want to understand who you are and and how did you end up in this space, which is something that I think people only think about maybe once a year when they actually use the system, but generally is not top of mind. What path led you here? Yeah, well, it's been, I would say, an an extraordinary journey and an incredible privilege to work with 911 and first responders all day long. And, you know, definitely look forward to getting into that. But like you said, like most, you know, most people, most Americans, this was a system I knew very little about. I was uh, kid from a farm in rural Indiana. And I, uh, you know, after college, ended up in New York City, working in venture capital and was just walking home late one night. Uh, I was like two in the morning. Um, I lived in Spanish Harlem at the time. And it, you know, (laughs) this is a challenge that literally smacked me in the face. (laughs) So uh, I I got off the subway at uh, uh, 110th in in Lexington and uh, just was followed back. It was pretty clear as I crossed the street, this individual crossed the street, as I broke out into a light jog, he picked up his pace as well. Um, and in that moment, your brain is just rushing, right? Like it goes into hyperdrive and you're like, what do I do? And obviously you immediately think about 911, but you also, in that moment of extreme clarity, you also realize like, how am I going to be able to get my cell phone out in the middle of an assault, somehow have a conversation with a 911 telecommunicator, and then like, you know, verbally articulate my name, my address, like what's occurring, you know, like how many ambulances would you say, Mr. Assailant, we're going to need, how bad are you beating me up right now? <laughs> so um, it, it really was this kind of extraordinary moment. And, and, and actually got, I was really fortunate. I, I, you know, it came to me that I probably wasn't going to be able to do that. And I, I was able, Uber had recently come out and I had the Uber app. And I was able to press a button and I, there must have been an Uber car that was like a block away. So, you know, as I was kind of running from this guy, all of a sudden there was someone else on this deserted street in Spanish Harlem at 2 a.m. And um, the guy jogged past me, fortunately. And then, you know, separately, Eric, I had a, um, my, my father had an incident where he had slipped and fallen off. Um, this was a, a few months later, had slipped and fallen off the roof of the childhood home I grew up in, in rural Indiana. And there was no one at home at the time. And where I'm from, there's just very weak cell phone reception. So unfortunately, it just wasn't an environment where you could call 911 from a cell phone and get help. So it's kind of crazy, right, to think that like, you know, we have Wi-Fi at our home. So if you 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 could call 911 over Skype or there was some other, you know, if you could connect via the Internet (laughs) to first responders, you could get help. But that, that just didn't exist. So. 911, I mean, it, it's extraordinary the work they do, but it, it, you know, it's 650,000 emergencies a day in the United States, nearly 4 million globally. So it is a, a um, you know, it's a significant scale challenge that we're trying to solve. Okay. And I think a lot of people would have just gone home, slept it off, told the story yesterday and said, that was, uh, you know, glad I got out of there and you'd have one more story in your life. And 
you, I guess, coming from this VC perspective, maybe had the the mindset to then think through <laughs> what what is the problem here. Uh, but did it immediately occur to you the next day that there needs to be a new solution here, or is this something that um, two three years later kind of matured slowly into into a clearer idea around rapid uh, kind of coalesced into rapid SOS? Yeah, it's you know I'm, I'm kind of like a. <laughs> <laughs> scrawny little dude here. And so, you know, it was like pretty visceral actually. Uh, in this moment I, you know, I, I uh, grew up on a farm, so didn't really have these sorts of things <laughs> happen to me. So, um, it might, you know, my name, my mind was just racing, uh, that, that whole evening. And so initially I thought it was, it was a user experience question. You know, you ought to be able to just press a button and get a response and was working with, a friend of venture capital at the time. So we decided to explore this further. And we had a rule that every week we needed to talk to 20 different 911 centers. So we just began cold calling 911 centers across the United States. And it was, Eric, I would just tell you, extraordinary. Like the, the, the story of Rapid SOS is really a story of the broader 911 community coming together to build this technology. Like we were a set of computer nerds and, you know, we're over 100 people now, but we're still that way. <laughs> and this community just time and time again, from those very earliest days, would receive cold calls and what, you know, these are very intense, busy jobs. And yet the 911 center director would take my call, answer a bunch of stupid questions from me, right? And then, you know, I, they would keep taking my call as we would, uh, you know, keep learning. Um, so it didn't take long to realize that this was this challenge was so much greater than a user experience challenge. It really was a United States, and as we've learned more, a global infrastructure challenge. So as I mentioned, you have 650,000 emergencies a day in the United States. Most of those emergencies are still traversing a 1960s, largely analog, voice-only system. And so we live in a world where there is approximately 7 billion connected devices today with incredible amounts of information. And when you call 911 prior to Rapid SOS, they typically would not even know your name. They were literally getting less data than caller ID. And it was amazing how well the system worked in light of that. I mean, it's a true testament to the people of 911. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, it quickly became clear that this was a pretty significant infrastructure challenge across the country. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because uh, I've maybe very fortunately never had to use 911, but I, I would have kind of assumed that if I just dial 911 and have my phone in my pocket, somehow somebody's going to show up uh, at some point and, and take care of me, uh, that they would know they'd be able to track my location and so forth. But can you walk us through a bit more detail then? What what are the different layers of, of the, the challenges here that extend from the uh, technical architecture down through the uh, the end user? Uh, that you've had to address in, in building the solution as it is today. Yeah, and I think you know the, the 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 fundamental challenge here is just the lack of data. It's basically a te- legacy telecom voice only system. So just to put it in perspective, a nine one one call typically will come in and be limited to only five hundred and twelve bytes of data. Now we don't live in a world where we talk about bytes of data anymore, right? We we talk about megabytes of data, like you know, a typical internet connection maybe might be 500 megabytes per second, right? That's 500 million bytes of data per second. But the entirety of data in a normal 911 call is limited to 512 bytes in total. Like to put that in perspective, like that's less data than the very first transatlantic telegram trans. Uh, transmitted back in 1858 between the Queen of England and President Buchanan 160 plus years ago. So, you know, we're, here we are in, in 2019 with an iPhone in your pocket and in the worst moment of your life, 911 does not even know your name typically. And the challenge in solving that is that it's not just one system. It's approximately 6,000 different 911 centers that are running approximately 25,000 different systems across the United States alone. And so the result is that if you want to create kind of this standardized system for rich emergency data, you have to figure out how to integrate into all those systems. And I think, you know, originally, you know, had all sorts of naive assumptions about how to do that, right? I mean, we we initially thought, oh, well, you know, 911 centers will surely have, you know, internet access, so we're just going to put a web browser up. And I think, you know, as you start to spend time in 911 centers and, and our team spends about 30,000 hours a year uh, working with 911 centers, 
you learn very quickly just how this is not like really any other job. I'll never forget, Eric, the very first time I went to center I visited, it was in rural Massachusetts. It was a you know warm spring day, beautifully sunny outside, and, and I was inside lifting it on my first call. And it was a mother who called after her son had committed suicide. And she was hysterical. You know, I, I lasted on that phone call about 15 seconds and I took off my headset and actually walked outside. Now that 911 telecommunicator had to stay on the phone, figure out the address where that woman was at. And then she stayed with her until an ambulance arrived eight minutes later. Then she ended that phone call and she proceeded to take calls for the rest of her 12 hour shift, making like $35,000 a year. So just shipping more data over the wall, having a live video feed from inside the home or something like that, right, would not have been helpful. It would have only added more trauma to that incident. And so the more time we spent working with 911 telecommunicators across the United States, we just realized the intensity of this role. And we realized we had to figure out how to slot this content into their existing software systems and their existing operating procedures. And, and that really was it turned out to be a you know a pretty significant challenge. We're now seven years in. We've raised close to a hundred million dollars, and really you know we're still really early from a commercial scale because we just had to kind of keep iterating. We ultimately would work with over four thousand first responders to build out all this tech and to plug in into over ten thousand different systems across the United States. Yeah, incredible, incredible. So. And these first responders, um, I guess they just have a laundry list of, of challenges that they've been dealing with for 10, 20, well, for the, the lifetime of the, the system to an extent, right? So, so you have this incredible group of people that are helping you know, customers to an extent, right, that are driving the, um, the development. So what, what, does this, um, what does this mean from um, a solution perspective? You need to get data from you know, my phone about who I am, where I live, where I'm hopefully right now, um, into this legacy system. Where is the data coming from right now? Then I, I know you have a number of partnerships. Is this, um, is this partnership uh, uh, data? Um, how are you procuring this data that they have not had access to for, for the, you know, the existence of the system up to this date? Yeah, awesome. So, so maybe what I'll do is... is um probably answer the first question, which is like, kind of how do we have to, how do we do that? And then secondly, what are the sources of the data? On the how part, um, we started out by, because we really were working to shift the paradigm from a voice conversation in a really challenging environment to a data-driven flow. And so to do that, we studied uh, about 12 and a half million 911 calls. We, we, we looked at all the questions that the 911 telecommunicators would ask in order to get to an answer that says, you know, you need to send a, a uh, advanced life support ambulance to one, two, three main street, for example. Um, and, and, and then we actually looked at what data would be relevant, where in the conversation to get to that answer faster. And so there's a very large and robust data model that sits behind our, our architecture. And what that serves to do is to look at how we get the right data to the right place at the right time to facilitate a faster, more effective emergency response. And then from an engineering standpoint, there's a lot of work we have to do to clean the data, credential the information, secure it, and then pass it through in a very mission-critical, time-sensitive manner into what's typically a, an existing legacy software system. In some cases, it could be a 10-plus-year-old software system that that municipality might be, might be using for a portion of their operations. And so that's kind of what we've done across the United States. Um, we've also built a large credentialing authority. So most of our partners are extremely sensitive to their information. So the result is that they're only sending us data where a 911 center has signed up and it's using that content. So, um, for example, if a 911 center isn't yet kind of equipped to receive medical or health information, that information is not going to be passed through our platform, um, as an example. So there's a, a very large geofencing component for the United States that goes through credentialing, what, what software systems is that agency using, what are they trained up to use, what are they accepting, et cetera. So there's kind of this, this large data model. How does that work if, so I'm in transit, right? I'm, I'm here in Shanghai from Portland, Oregon, and then I go to uh, Milwaukee, for example. As I move across these different 911 jurisdictions, is the, the type of data that can be transferred 
being modified by your system according to the geography that I'm in at that point in time. How does that work for people in transit? Yeah, g- g- great question, Eric. So, so it is based off your generally quite accurate location. Um, location is, is coming from various input sources. The two largest for us are uh, Google and Apple um, and their, their uh, smartphone operating systems. So if you call 911 when you're in transit, so you're, you'll hit an initial 911 jurisdiction. When your call arrives behind the scenes, the software queries us and based off the query key and your location and knowing the credentialing authorities of that agency, there's a variety of information in that kind of secure handshake that occurs. That's when um, we pass whatever information has been authorized to be shared around that incident. And if you, if you move into, if you move into a new agency, if that call gets transferred, the same process occurs basically all over again, where as soon as the call is at the new agency, once again, there is this kind of secure handshake that occurs and that authorizes cert- certain information to be shared. And then data that's not used is, is obviously discarded um, in our system. So we're not, a, you know, we're not a data retention or data company. Okay. So the data then is passed to the, uh, the individual who's receiving the call, but they're still using the legacy interface. Do these interfaces already have the, all of the required fields or are you then having to work with whoever's providing those interfaces to make sure that the interface can actually visualize the, the data? Or? Yeah, that was one of the things that, that uh, took a lot of time. Is, is, um, we're now about seven years in, as I mentioned. We've worked with uh, over 70 different public safety technology vendors to interface into over 10,000 different systems. So uh, there was a, a significant amount of work that went into the user experience components of that. And again, to the credit of our partners, uh, many of them had large teams on this. So we would work with those folks. So you know, large public safety technology organizations, like for example, like a Motorola Solutions, um, where they have a suite of different solutions out there and a large design team. So we would partner with them to kind of develop those interfaces. Then we would often do focus groups with their customers. So this was a you know, multi-year process where we worked with 4,000 plus first responders. We worked with over 70 different technology vendors in the space to build out those capabilities. Gotcha. And right now, if I look at your website, you have, I think, four, four products. You have the emergency API suite, the clearinghouse integration, and rapid SOS portal. Are these all essential and all integrated together in all situations? Or is it a, it's a situation where one center might say, I, I want access to the clearinghouse only? Can you kind of break down the, the solution and, and just help to understand what is the decision process for somebody that's integrating this into their, into their systems? So you can think of us a little bit as a two-sided platform. So um, on the input side, we have various data providers that, that we work with. So these are you know, some, some large examples, as I mentioned, Apple, Google, um, we power um, um, Uber's emergency functionality. We power um, some, some large connected car platforms. So things like that, for example, that feed data into our system. And that's through our emergency API. It's a pretty standardized, modern REST API with support for a, a number of different use cases, whether that's directly from a device. Um, we recently added support for professional monitoring centers for things like the security industry. Um, we actually also do an ability to do loved one notifications or actually loop in a monitoring station. So basically the idea is that any sort of built environment or sensor can initiate an emergency response now. And in some cases, like a car crash, you know, it might make sense to go directly to 911 versus in other cases like a smoke alarm going off. It might make sense to verify that that incident is real, whether you confirm with a homeowner or you go through a professional monitoring station, whatever that is. So our emergency API is a platform that ingests that initial emergency signal and any other associated data cleans it, standardizes it, credentials it, verifies it increasingly in a sensor-driven approach, and then um, passes that into our emergency clearinghouse. Is all of our kind of cloud infrastructure that is built to manage the over 400 million emergency events a year. And so the clearinghouse is going to kind of complete the process of the credentializing, um, standardization, securing of the data, and then it passes it into one of two different outputs into the 911 center. And that might be an integrated solution, which is um, inside one of those different um, 70 plus public safety technology vendors, 10,000 different systems. Or it might be for our own product, which we call Rapid SOS Portal. And we do 
portal is also embedded in a bunch of different software systems. So it's just, um, it's kind of like the 911 center can choose the various interface that they want to receive the content in. But, but you are correct. There's kind of four main product pieces that all fit together to manage that end-to-end emergency. Yeah, and it sounds like some of these then could be used by non-emergency agencies, right? So these could be used potentially by, they could be integrated maybe by another technology company. I think you mentioned loved one notices. So if I, if I want to make sure that my, my grandmother is, is okay, then I could potentially have some connected devices in her, in her house that would just be pinging me. Maybe uh, everything is okay or mild emergency, give her a call. Is, is that right that there could also be then private users of the system? That's exactly right. In fact, we do that for a number of customers today where they might have some sort of sensor and, for example, in an aging in place scenario, so a wearable device um, on someone's grandparent. And if it detects a fall or if they just press the panic button, rather than going immediately to 911, in some cases that will go to, we partner with a variety of um, professional monitoring services. So these are our private call centers, or we can go to the family members. And so the family members can then speak to that loved one. And if um, the loved one is not responsive or if they're in need of help, we basically can conference in 911 near the loved one. And on the screen of 911 will be all the vital signs and other information from that loved one. And, um, and we can actually do that from anywhere in the world. So the telecom and data routing capabilities are kind of in a very modern, scalable cloud infrastructure, which, for example, if, if, it, you, know, if you were calling from China and your a mother was, was in um, Wisconsin, like we could help connect you to provide a response for your mother, uh, even if she wasn't able to speak. Oh, interesting. Uh, what, what is the perspective of the 911 providers today on, on IoT data? Because I, I, I suppose the system is set up to take an input from a human, right? Uh, I need help or, you know, we, we need help in this uh, situation. If you have a, maybe a, a smartwatch that says, you know, this person might have had a, a stroke um, or a car that says, you know, this, this car might have just had an accident. Is that data sufficient to trigger an emergency event? Or is there another process that that type of uh, machine data would flow through in order to result in uh, emergency vehicle or, or support being provided? Yeah, and I think, Eric, you're, you're kind of leading to, this is one of the really powerful things about switching from an analog voice call into a rich data framework is the power of more sophisticated devices and multiple data feeds to verify and provide critical contextual information around an incident. So, uh, you know, in, in the old world, you might have had kind of a legacy smoke alarm that went off. And you may not know, is it just, you know, you burnt the pizza or the home's on fire versus in a modern connected home, you could have more than one sensor going off. You could have a thermostat where the temperature is rising. You could have a camera feed verifying through image recognition that there's flame in the incident, in the shot, et cetera. So, so what, what I think is really powerful here is how we can merge multiple different sensor feeds to drive that, that verified effective response. We've been doing a variety of testing, and, and compared to those legacy flows, it's really profound in terms of the ability to accelerate response for the 911 center and also to help them dispatch the most appropriate units possible. Um, often looking at between 10 and 20 plus minutes faster response time, which, um, as, you're, as you're probably aware, Eric, can be really profound in an emergency. I mean, uh, in the early stages of a fire during flashover, uh, it's typically growing at a rate that approaches doubling in size every 30 seconds. So getting the fire department there 10 minutes faster is often the difference between the entire home being burnt up and the damage being confined to one room. Yeah, I'm thinking about something like a, a car accident as well, where um, you know, I unfortunately had some, some of uh, the people I, I went to school with die in uh, car accidents in, in high school. And this is not, unfortunately, uncommon in the US just because of the issues with drinking and driving. So you could foresee a, a situation where, you know, there could just be a signal that this car is um, accelerating, you know, in such a way that indicates that the driver might be drunk or it's, uh, it's exceeding a speed limit by a certain rate. And that might potentially trigger then an activity. Is the system already set up to take inputs from vehicles or sensors that indicate that an event has not yet occurred, but that there's a certain probability that an event might occur? 
uh, based on the, the data being received by the, the system? We're thinking a lot about how we can partner with our various data partners to do exactly what you're describing there, Eric. Is like, are there steps where you can take actually preventative action, which obviously has the greatest impact of all? Today in the automotive space, uh, we do have a, a couple different partnerships where we, at the very least, we're able, as soon as that impact occurs, to get all the critical information directly to 911 and first responders. So just to give you an example of that, like compared to an environment where you would have an accident and then you would need to call 911, or perhaps you would rely on like a third party um, uh, auto club or other service to call on your behalf from a call center somewhere, you know, now you can have instantly on the screen of 911, make model color of the vehicle, how many people are inside based off the seatbelt sensors. So there's, you know, four people buckled in, crash severity using um, what they call delta V or change in velocity around the impact. So very quickly, the, the 911 center can go from, you know, taking several minutes to get a phone call and then having a multi-minute conversation and, and then trying to dispatch the most appropriate unit resources to immediately understand the situation, getting four ambulances out to the scene uh, immediately. So um, in, in a life-threatening medical emergency, and for which, you know, unfortunately, to your point, you get this a lot in, in car accidents. In the U.S., we have nearly 6 million car accidents a year, and you have a, around 2 million drivers that are experienced permanent injuries, over thirty, around 35,000 fatalities a year. Every minute you save in a life-threatening emergency like that is approximately a 2.2% reduction in mortality rate. So the impact that we can have by taking that sensor information and immediately getting it into the hands of 911 and first responders is absolutely profound is when it comes to human life around these major incidents. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot we can do there. Yeah, I guess there's a, another way that preventative systems could be set up, which is the, the reverse flow, right? If there is maybe a, an active shooter situation in a mall or there's a, a forest fire in a particular location, you could potentially have the, the system already being aware of the situation, but the individuals in the community not being aware of the situation. Are you able today or are you considering how to have that, that reverse data flow where people in the vicinity would then be receiving a, a message on their mobile that says, go towards this, move away from this location or this area is unsafe or you know, take, take cover, uh, some, some sort of uh, message that would uh, indicate that there's a particular danger in, a, in an environment? Yeah, we are absolutely working with 911 centers to figure out how can we more effectively manage mass events. And it's, you know, it's something that's pretty close to home. I, uh, I got married last week and my, uh, my wife is a, is a doctor in Las Vegas. She was there in residency during the Las Vegas shooting. And obviously this was one of the largest mass shooting events in U.S. history. Um, we also have um, been involved in helping to manage, you know, we, we play a small part compared to the first responders, but helping to manage many of the mass incidents we've seen over the last couple of years in the United States. Um, and I think about like just the extraordinary challenging environment. Like um, if you listen to the Paradise Fires 911 calls and just how quickly these centers become overwhelmed with the phones ringing. You know, it's like a, it's a call center where in a major incident, just getting totally inundated with information, you know, with, with phone calls, but there's generally a lack of situational awareness. So one of our new products, which is, um, uh, excuse me, called Jurisdiction View, actually plots in real time all those requests for emergency service on one master view. And, and we actually are able to transmit the data in many cases before the phone even rings. So now what that allows a 911 center to do is to geographically manage a mass incident. So for example, in a, in a less severe case, if you had a major car accident and say you had 100 inbound calls around it, this, this happens on like the 101 in California, and then you had someone across town who was having a heart attack, right now that person could be 100 callers back in the queue because 911 has to work through each of the phone calls. But now they can see that it's a distinct incident and they can actually answer that that individual heart attack incident before they answer you know call number 48 around the car accident but in mass incidents which is where, where you, i think you started here eric um we can now give them this master situational awareness view so in the case of paradise where you had hot embers that were blowing ahead of the main fire front and you were skidding spot fires all over town and, and where local authorities just had a very challenging environment to kind of understand that operational environment now you can start to get this master operating picture of that, which naturally leads to your next point, Eric, which is 
then we can start to provide advance notice to people in harm's way. And I think that is absolutely, you know, that vision that we are working towards, which is, you know, how can we actually start to warn people in advance of these incidents before they occur? And, um, you know, we, we haven't rolled out a specific product there yet, but that, that's um, certainly something that we're working on right now with a, a number of our public safety partners. This is uh, an area where, you know, this is a, a, a public need. It's an area where it almost probably feels a bit strange to talk about uh, money, but you are venture backed and you have 100 employees and you, you need to operate the, the business to continue developing these solutions. So let's go a little bit into the, the business model here. I see on your website, it says available at no cost to public safety agencies nationwide through rapid SOS portal or integrations. Let's say, who are your, your paying users? Who are your free users? And if you just go into a little bit of detail of what would the solution look like from, from the business perspective? It really was in those early days. In the summer, of, so, so after I had that experience in New York, I went to, um, went to grad school and I, the summer of grad school, I borrowed my dad's Prius and I drove over 1500 miles and met with 911 centers all across the United States. And my, my co-founder, uh, Nick Horlick, who was uh, wrapping up his PhD at MIT at the time, he was actively coding our software. So we would talk every day after I spoke to these 911 centers. And, and it was just, it felt like a seminal moment for me in that journey and for Nick in figuring out like, what do we, where do we want to grow up if this idea ends up making it? And we just felt strongly that the 911 community, the first responders are just doing extraordinary work and they're under resourced, understaffed, way underpaid. And it, it felt like it would be a deviation from our mission to try to monetize for this, this, you know, certainly for our core service offer, right? Around providing baseline location and, and core data around an incident in the United States. And so today we do provide that service for free to 911 centers. Um, we cover about 90% of the U.S. population for that. So most 911 centers in the United States are using our service today for every one of their emergencies. We do manage uh, close to 400,000 incidents a day, about $150 million a year. So the business model here is really about how can we align ourselves with people that want better outcomes and how can we allow traditional players in security, emergency response, um, alarm companies, um, digital health companies to provide a faster, more effective, lower cost offering to those to their member bases. And so our input partners pay us for, for this service. And then we also try to align ourselves with insurance companies as well. So you can take a given car accident as an example, right? And by the time you repair two vehicles, deal with the health, resulting healthcare treatment cost, pay for the tow truck and other types of first responder sort of incidents, you could be looking at you know, over $100,000 of cost around that incident. So if we can do things to, to um, prevent it before it occurs and to drive a faster, more effective response to reduce medical treatment cost afterwards, it, it really is a, a, a triple, one, triple win. The 911 center wins, obviously the individual and the emergency wins, but also the insurance company also wins. So that, that, that's kind of one example, Eric. And then the other example would be new kind of these, these various systems, sensors, or services where getting an emergency response is an important component or an add-on service. So for Uber, for example, we'll power over 100 million Uber rides a year in the United States where we provide that blanket of protection so that if you ever were to have a heart attack or some sort of emergency in, a, you know, in an Uber, it's one tap and, there, and immediately 911 is going to know your name, the driver's name, make model color of the vehicle, and update it in real time, your, your location, so all that, that critical information. Um, we've had a number of wearables companies where we power their court service offering so that if they detect a fall for a senior or some sort of health emergency, we actually facilitate the response. We also, as I mentioned, provide that monitoring function as well. So that even if, you know, if it's not something that requires a 911 response, we can still provide a professional that can talk to that individual, make sure they're safe, et cetera. So, um, so it's a, we, we're really enabling our partners to offer new services um, in the home security, commercial security, vehicle crash response, digital health, wearables, markets. Michael, this has been super interesting. I, I love your mission. I think uh, this is really one of the, the most interesting uh, companies that I've, I've spoken with on the podcast here. I'm sure there's a lot to your business that we, we haven't delved into. Is there anything else that 
you think is uh, is really critical that we cover either about you know how you're operating today or or um, where you're going to as uh, as next steps as you as you continue to grow Rapid SOS. I think there's probably uh, two different maybe last parting thoughts I would have. One is just for your tech audience here, which is today we live in a world with close to seven billion connected devices, and whether or not your device was purpose built to drive emergency response. So, you know, not every wearable device was meant to play in the help I fall in and kick it up space. But almost certainly in certain incidences, the data on that device could be transformative and life-saving for the owner of that system. So whether it's a connected building, a connected car, a wearable health device, any sort of these, these sensors in our environment around us, you know, we really would like to partner to get that information into the hands of 911 to really turn that connected device into a life-saving device. So I think that that's, that's the first point. The second point is just for, I think, a lot of people that just don't necessarily have a lot of visibility in how 911 works. It's just to, you know, really say thank you on behalf of all of us to the 911 and first responder community. I mean, it's just hard to describe until you've been in one of these centers or done a ride along to describe just how intense that job is. And these are heroes that do this every single day, 12 hour shifts. And, you know, they're, they're generally underpaid and underappreciated. And, and so it's, you know, it's just extraordinary the work they've done on the side after work on the weekends to build this with us. I mean, it really is a collective effort of over 4,000 first responders now that has led to rapid SOS. And I, I'm just, it, you know, as a founder here, it's just an extraordinary privilege to work with this community. Yeah, and maybe we should just then uh, make a, a call out also to the listeners. You know, a lot of our listeners are either working with younger IoT device or software companies, or let's say more legacy companies that have been, you know, building solutions for industrial or for for building management for for decades. And a lot of them are in, in situations where their devices are not purpose built to identify emergencies, but do collect data that might indicate an emergency around a, a fire in a factory, uh, an issue in, a, in, an, in an elevator. Um, and uh, yeah, I would encourage those companies to think through whether it makes sense to you know, even just, um, let's put aside um, for, for a moment, kind of, you know, creating goodwill, but just just from a business perspective, it might be kind of a differentiating value proposition to say that the data that we're already deriving through our product can also be used to increase safety in your factory and your building and in your uh, in your facility. So um, yeah, I would encourage companies to to follow up. Uh, and and then certainly there's I think this is a mission that everybody can get behind. So that's that's uh, kind of a going to be an, an easy sell to the R and D teams to get them uh, working on on projects with Rapid OS. I'm, I'm sure, Michael. Thank you so much again for taking the time to, to talk with us. This is uh, really fascinating, and I'll, for one, certainly keep a tab on on where you uh, where you continue to develop to. Thank you, Eric. Really great to be on the show, and I appreciate the time here. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.